すごい牛乳好きだね強くなるからね強くはい。He's shy. What can you do? It's not a crime. It's more a disability. Like being retarded or partially. Well, what the fuck? I'm getting way off subject here. 1960s Japan. And I guess you could say that the country were riding a gravy train with biscuit wheels. Or should I say a soy sauce train with sushi wheels. But either way, the atomic bomb was a distant memory. And the country had risen like a phoenix from the ashes. And with its cheaply produced electronics, become a trade superpower. Even their movies were making a killing at the international box office. With this particular one being Godzilla, which I think has held the test of time and is still quite entertaining. But I'm not sure that the Osaka family had even seen the Godzilla movies. But they were certainly indulging in the country's new economic success. Because Mr. Osaka was a big shot in Japan's state-owned railways. One of the most prestigious jobs in the country. Where its employees were paid handsomely at a time in post-war Japan that other salaries were low. It was a Tuesday afternoon when Mr. Osaka brought his young daughter and son into work to show them off to his employees. And he decided to treat his two young children. Children to some tasty milk. Nah, not this kind of milk. This kind of milk. At the time, considered a drink of the West, 
where a single bottle could set you back a day's wage. Nevertheless, Yamamoto bought both of his kids a bottle, including one for himself. But upon first sipping the delicious beverage, all three fell to the floor in the busy office and started convulsing, and shit and puke started spraying out of them, and they were dead in less than a minute. And while this was happening, standing over the family and laughing was Akio Momoto, who also worked in the office at the railway station, and she admitted the whole thing, that she poured pesticide into each of the bottles before resealing them. As she was led away, she screamed she hated milk, the opulence of the West trying to bring down Japan. I'm wondering if this also includes Yuhu and the murder trial. Well, they were the talk of the town, and I guess the course didn't have much sympathy because they sentenced her to death and hung the fucking bitch four years later. And although milk in Japan is still heavily associated with the West, and Japanese either love it or hate it, most of them will agree that it ain't worth killing for. I'm thinking about milk right now. I guess the expression, waking up on the wrong side of the bed, applies to everyone's, even Orientals. And it certainly demonstrates the importance of getting a good night's sleep to improve one's prospects for the next day. If you get my drift. And I ain't asking. Such is the case of one Nabushi Kawafuchi. Whoops. <laughs> I guess no one may ever know what triggered the 20-year-old to go postal. But there's one thing for sure. The usually mild-mannered carpenter lost his fucking egg roll. It was while driving on the way to work that Kawafuchi didn't stop completely at a stop sign, and a police officer pulled him over to have a word with him. And I guess that he took umbrage from something that the cop said, and he grabbed his carpenter tool from the passenger seat and caved in the Jap cop's skull. From there, he fled the scene, driving down towards the waterfront. Once down at the docks, Kawafuji pulled out two rifles that he had stolen, and then he boarded a ferry. No, not a gay person, a boat. And then he hijacked it, telling the captain, probably a Japanese captain, to take him on an adventure. His words, not mine. And it was from there that the ferry captain did just that, taking 33 passengers and 11 crew members on a 17-hour adventure up and down the coast with the police following along on the shore, engaging in a ship-to-shore gun battle, all while cops begged him to let his hostages go. And once he let them go, that's when the action really began, all on live television. And I guess the cops, well, they got tired of waiting, because one of the snipers took the cop into down, downtown. Oh, jeez, that don't look good. And what made the siege all that more exciting was that it was all caught on live TV. The first time for such an event, with 30% of the country's workforce calling in sick that day, so they could enjoy a live execution. And when cops started poking around, investigating the mental oriental, on reasons why he was so unsettled, his friends say that he was a gentle individual. But all of them agree that if he didn't get a good night's sleep, he was prone to quick temper, with several stating the night before he'd splattered the cop's brains, he'd been out late at a work event. But either way, I guess we'll never know the cop and his true motives. And although his little adventure was a ratings hit, it seems the only legacy that he left behind was a skid mark on the ship. <laughs> When you think of Japan, terrorism generally doesn't come to mind. But in 1971-72, it was all a rage. And I guess the Japs didn't want to get left out. So a bunch of filthy left-wing hippies, as if there were any other kind, formed their own terrorist group and called it the United Red Army, heavily affiliated with the Palestinian Army, with a commie credo that had a problem with everybody, most notably the imperialism of America. I bet you they still ate at McDonald's, though. But after several high-profile incidences in which civilians and police were killed, including several airline hijackings, the government decided to eliminate the pesky hippies. And now with many of the group either dead or on the run, only a small number of the most devoted were left 
to fly the Red Army's flag, so Cobbs figured it was time for them to deliver the death blow. But just as they were about to move in, the terrorists were tipped off, and many believe it was someone inside the police force. The group, now desperate and down to a pathetic seven members, decided to make one last attempt to bring attention to their cause. Their plan was to storm a well-known ski resort and take hostages. But unknown to the terrorists, the resort was empty. Everybody gone on a day trip ice skating. And with the owner out walking his dog, the only one in the villa was his wife. But on his return, he spotted the heavily armed commies entering the villa and called the police. And I guess if the noodle-eating commies wanted attention, they got it. And it was just overnight that half of Japan's army had arrived on the scene, along with all the country's media. After all, this is the early 70s and terrorism is big news. And now that Japan had their own group, it made it even more newsworthy. And the Red Army now had the audience that they needed to spread their syphilitic message, but with only one hostage. Now, they were hoping for a better turnout. It was on the 10th day of that siege, after being broadcasted live all over Japan. With the public sympathy starting to lean towards the commies, the army thought enough was enough, and they made their move on the resort. Using a wrecking ball, they started smashing down the walls. Then with fire hoses, sprayed ice-cold water into the resort, attempting to flood the terrorists out. But the Red Army knew that this was their last stand and they weren't going to be taken down so easy. And they started firing at the army, wounding 47 soldiers and killing one. Also killing an idiot bystander who was watching from a tree. The soldiers now started shooting tear gas into the windows. All while a quarter of Japan sat on their couches eating their noodles watching the action unfold. But what the viewer wasn't to know and couldn't possibly have known was that for the army to get inside that building it was almost impossible because the terrorists had barricaded themselves into the top three floors so anyone who entered that narrow staircase would be sitting ducks like shooting fish in a barrel easy peasy japanesey so the army were forced to try to smoke the cocksuckers out and while they waited, the filthy commies used them as target practice. But after the 10-day siege, it was a mixture of tear gas, frozen water, and freezing temperatures that brought the terrorists out. And the Red Army was no more. There is a perception in this world that we, as sentient beings, are above all the very crudities of this world. Like the hunter. And the hunted. But there are those who say that as a species, that this is our greatest folly. Because we are still only animals. Meet Eri Kinoshita, the seven-year-old, vicarious child with an easy-going personality, friendly, loves animals, and loves candy. And it was the love for that candy that she left school one day at lunch to seek it. And it would lead to her demise. Because it was the last time that she was seen alive. And we're about three hours later when some old fucker were out walking his dog and he saw a box in the middle of the sidewalk on a crowded street. Oh, look box. I guess he thought he'd take a look. And when he opened that box, inside of it was a nude body of the missing seven-year-old. And when forensics got the corpse back to the meat shop, started poking around, they figured that the girl had been raped, sodomized, fucked in every hole she had. You know the score. Then strangled to death. But then, she was brought back to life. And the killer did it all over again. You no good fucking animal. Don't you know that this is a baby? <laughs> The child's school bag 
had been found about 300 meters from her body. On her clothes, they were never found. And she'd been carrying an anti-crime prevention alarm. And that was never found. Several witnesses, I'm guessing Japanese witnesses, reported seeing a South American man, or what is commonly known as a beaner, at the scene of the crime carrying a cardboard box. And although I'm unsure Japanese citizens would use such derogatory terms, it certainly paints a vivid picture. Jose Manuel Yak, a typical beaner name, lived about five minutes from where the box were found. And when cops arrested him, he still had the smell of the seven-year-old on the end of his cock. They found out he'd entered the country under a false passport. And when they did a background check, they found out that he was wanted in Peru for being a pedophile. A fucking beaner pedophile. Have I offended you? I'm sorry. This ain't the fucking Disney Channel. You can tell, because there's no mouse ears in the corner of the screen. A crime that had left all of Japan in a state of fear. A country so arrogant to believe that their children were safe and could walk the streets without fear. And now they knew they weren't safe. And although the girl and the crimes against her were protected by law, Jap law, the father insisted that every detail about what happened to his daughter be released along with her name so everybody knew that they weren't safe. In no room. We are sure not safe.